put our hands together and magnify the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And if you may be redundant, but if you haven't taken the time to smile today, this would be an opportune moment. Sometimes you look kind of scary out there, especially after a hard day's work. Why don't you turn to somebody close to you there, share that smile with them, give them a Holy Ghost handshake, and tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. Well, John and Sister Amy are going to lead us in some songs of worship. And so we're going to worship with them and uh, create a climate that pastor can come and bring his lesson in an atmosphere that he can maybe find a lodging place in our heart. Amen. Holy, holy. 
He's great. Let's give him great praise tonight. Can we thank you, Father? standing just for a moment we have some special requests to take to the Lord but prior to that if you are one of the men who will be uh, participating in the men's retreat uh, this weekend uh, if you have not paid please do that tonight if you have not got a map to the, the camp please get one of those the brethren in the foyer and they will be happy to help you with that it's always a great time of fellowship and uh, if you want to have dinner with me Friday night, it's going to have to be up there because that's where I'll be. <laughs> Amen. Uh, as we go to the Lord, let's remember Sherry Blackwood's sick, needs a touch in her body. Sister Rochelle Salyards has valley fever. Bless her heart. So let's pray the Lord will touch her. Sue McCollum has cancer. Let's continue to remember Sister Janet Dwight that the Lord would be with her and uh, just speak wholeness into that situation. Jim Gray, this is our pastor's father-in-law, is having back surgery, so let's pray the Lord would have a hand in that. Jose Juarez having a heart procedure tomorrow. This is a father of Brother, one, uh, Brother Jason Price's friends. Let's continue to remember Sister Debbie Shockley and the Shockley family. Sister Debbie is in very, very critical uh, condition, and uh, we do not understand all the ways of life and God but we know that he is God and we know he's sovereign you believe that he made this body he can fix it and I understand that we're all going to meet him and, and that's his will that we leave this world somewhere along the line we've let the devil sell us a lie that death is a defeat for a child of God and it is not to leave this world ready to know him is the greatest victory there is. So we're just going to pray that God take her at his hands and work his will and that everything be well. Amen. I wonder by a show of hands, perhaps you didn't have time to get a request in. God is mindful. He understands. He wants to meet our needs, but he wants us to ask him. So let's do it right now. In the name of the Lord, we come to you, Jesus. Praying, God, that you could be touched by our feelings. We plead your blood over these petitions. Ask that your hand of healing minister to these that are sick in body. You can speak wholeness into every one of these situations. God, we pray the mantle of your anointing on the service tonight. God, give us ears to hear your counsel. Anoint our pastor's mind and mouth to speak your will into our hearts. God, we thank you for the privilege of knowing you hearing your word and walking in your presence we give you praise in the name of Jesus tonight and let's do it one more time Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come we're going to give you the chance to worship the Lord in your giving and we're going to continue to worship him entertain the presence of the Lord pastor is going to come if you did not get a handout uh, to follow the lesson, you'd like one, the ushers have them. They'll be glad to give you one. Uh, kind of helps you stay on track and keep your mind disciplined to what pastor's leading us to, and we're grateful for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the incredible privilege of knowing you, the great privilege of living in this unique and special country with all of its difficulties, still the most incredible place in the world to live. Thank you for every blessing, every benefit. Would you receive our gift as we give you our offering? Surrender back to you your tithe. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said... There is no mountain 
His grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. He's worthy. God, we thank you that you are an ever-present help in our time of trouble. God, that we can lean on you when the arm of flesh fails us. Thank you tonight, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, I'm like everybody else. I don't like tribulation. I don't like hardship. But Jesus said that we'd have it. But he said, be of good comfort. For I have overcome the world that you're going to have tribulation. Aren't you glad your hope is in him and not in this system? I love each of you, but my hope's not in you. My hope is in him. Amen. Hallelujah. It's great to be in the house of the Lord tonight. How many tonight would say, I'm blessed? You may not be happy, but you're blessed. Man, why don't you turn around, greet one another. If you're close to somebody you don't know, introduce yourself. Make everybody feel welcome tonight. As you're returning to your seat, you may be seated. <clears throat> Amen. When we came into this place tonight, we all walked in in 
this thing we call a body, flesh, that uh, if you're anything like me, you kind of struggle with, you argue with, you battle with, and, but the reality is, is this that we see on the outside, what we see in the mirror, is just that. It's just flesh. But there is something within, that is housed within this flesh that we simply call a soul. It's one of those things that's hard to really describe and um, understand, really, but it's what God breathed into the flesh that he formed out of the dust of the ground. It's that part of us that makes us us. Uh, and it's the part of us that when the flesh dies is left remaining. And so our task and our goal as Christians is to do our best when it comes to how we interact and use this flesh to make sure that we are doing the things that are good for our soul because our flesh and what we do with it has a huge impact on the soul uh, and vice versa. And we talked a few weeks ago about influences and mindsets that can literally bring pollution to our soul. And we talked about different ethics of our words, our minds, our finances, our, our honesty um, that can affect us in, in our soul. And what I want to talk about tonight is simply to start out with that we are called as children of God to be holy in all manner of conversation. That is our calling as followers of Jesus Christ. The Scripture, the New Testament, is full of phrases that should make it very clear that if we are to be true disciples, um, there is going to be a struggle that goes on with flesh. We're told to crucify flesh. We're told to deny ourselves. We're told to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And so it should be no mistake that being a true disciple of Jesus Christ is demanding. And I, I just want to remind you as children of God, as Christians, ultimately disciples, that anybody who tries to convince you that being a Christian uh, isn't demanding or shouldn't really be demanding and it, it, there surely shouldn't be much expected of you, that really flies in the face of what is taught in Scripture. And, and you can take a few scriptures out of context and, and, and try to assert that once you're saved, it really doesn't matter, and, and you're going to go on to heaven, and it doesn't matter how you live your life. But, but that really goes against everything that Jesus taught. It goes against what the disciples taught, the apostles taught. And Paul in 1 Corinthians, uh, if you've ever read Corinthians, uh, both books, you find that he's pretty adamant in the certain ways that we should live as, as Christians. And in 1 Corinthians 6, toward the end of that chapter, he tells us that as Christians, we are to come out from among them, being the world, those that are not believers, and be separate and touch not unclean things. And if we do, that we will be called his sons and daughters. And so there's promise there that if we will separate ourselves and we will, we will cleanse ourselves, that that's what it really ultimately be, means to become a son or daughter of God. And then in verse, chapter 7, verse 1, we start out, and that's going to be our text, our launching place for tonight. He says this, Having therefore these promises, the most recent of them, the chapter or the verse before, was that we would become the sons and daughters of God if we separate ourselves and, and, and pursue a life of purity. He said, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so tonight I want to use that as kind of launching play, place uh, where I want to talk to you for the next few moments about radioactive relationships, relationships that ultimately will fly in the face of what we're commanded to do here in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, where it, he tells us to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Because you and I both know that relationships have a, can have a polluting influence in our lives, both in our flesh and in our spirit. And so um, I want to start with a quote tonight from George Washington who once said, he said, associate with men of good quality 
if you esteem your own reputation. For it is better to be alone that in, than in bad company. And that's difficult for a lot of, especially for young people, because they're social, they want to be involved, they want to be around people. And a lot of times, uh, being around anybody, regardless of what kind of character they are, is better than being alone. Uh, but the reality is there are times in our lives where we're better suited not being with people than being with people. Now, that, there's a fine line there between becoming an isolationist and, and, and a loner, but, but at the same time, uh, there are certain places we shouldn't go with certain people at certain times simply because of what it will do to our character and our reputation. So, um, tonight I want to just kind of challenge you for a moment to think of your relatives, your associates, your friends, and I want you to think about the most difficult person in your life. Just think for a moment. Um, perhaps it's a mother that, you know, kind of seems normal at times, but then has those crazy spells that make you want to run for the bunker. You know, it's like, oh. Uh, maybe it's a dad who played favorites with the children um, and had a hot temper. Or maybe it was a, a sister who uh, was kind of, in competition with you, or, or she's kind of just one of those weird people that, you know, steals the salt and pepper shakers at every restaurant she goes to or something, you know, and it's just like, wow, this is, she's a piece of work. Uh, maybe it's a, a, that cousin or that uncle or that aunt that, that, you know, Thanksgiving dinner comes around and everybody's kind of praying, maybe, hopefully they don't show up this year, uh, because when they show up, there, there's problems that arise when, and drama that, that arises, and, and the reality is, is, in just about every family, there are, there's at least one person that, that makes it challenging for those that are around them. Maybe they're loud or they're obnoxious or they're defensive and detached, petty, disillusional or aggressive and combative and everything's a big fight and a big argument. And, you know, you could kind of use their, 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 um, their mood as, as like a mood ring as a, you know, traffic light because their mood changes so much, you know, it's just all over the place. And uh, the scary thing is, is as you sit here tonight, you may be that person. <laughs> you, you may be that person that you're, you're sitting close to somebody and they're thinking, well, that, that's the person that's in my life. But the bottom line is that, that people, the people around us can be a great blessing or they can be an extreme uh, trial in our life. They can be life-giving, they can be loving, they can be inspiring, or they can be draining, they can be helpful, or they can be discouraging. And so, on the converse of that, I want you to think of somebody in your life that inspires you, somebody that, that makes you better, somebody that, that challenges you and, and motivates you and, and, and just kind of makes you want to be or be a better person. And you should give thanks for that kind of person in your life. And, and you, should, you should be grateful for those. And, and so we have to tonight look at our lives and say, okay, God has placed different people in our lives and allowed certain people in our paths, and we need to learn to navigate those relationships and be wise in those relationships. And so, like I said, some of them have the potential to drag us down. Some of them have the potential for us to lift other people up. And then some of them are just toxic relationships that at some point we have to step back from and say, you know what, I can still love this person, but I can't spend very much time around this person. And I know on the surface that sounds like an unchristian thing to say because uh, as Christians we have a heart to reach out to people. And so as we go through this, I hope that uh, you will see what I'm talking about and why there are times where you have to, as it were, cut ties with certain people because of the toxicity of the relationship and what they do to you uh, in your spirit and, and ultimately your, your soul. And so the truth is, write this down, the people closest to you can be your greatest spiritual asset or your worst spiritual curse. The people closest to you can be your greatest spiritual asset or your worst spiritual curse. They will either propel you closer to God and encourage you to serve Him more faithfully, or they will corrupt your good intentions and rob you of the blessings that God wants to pour out in your life. And there are some people that once you have kind of, as it were, waded through the poisonous environment of their, their presence, that, that once you get through that, you're kind of left kind of 
in a puddle of sewage, as it were, nursing a corroded soul. And, and I think all of us probably have been in those situations at some point where we've spent time, too much time with a certain person, and it's like, after a while, it's like, man, I just feel like I'm, there's a corrosive influence that's going on in this relationship, and it's not doing me uh, any good ultimately. And so uh, one of the, the greatest lies of the enemy is that it doesn't matter who you spend your time with as long as you have the Holy Spirit in your life, that you, you're spirit-born and, and you know, God's in you, and so it really doesn't matter who you hang around with, doesn't matter who you spend time with. But the fact is the devil will try to convince you, write this down, that by playing with people in the gutter of their toxic lifestyles, you will actually actually be able to rescue them. Okay, he'll, he'll, he'll give this lie to you that, well, you need, you need to kind of get on their level. You need to kind of get involved in the things that they're doing uh, because you can rescue them out of that. And what we're going to learn tonight is, is that, yes, we have a commission to go and reach the world. And, yes, Jesus did eat with sinners. And, yes, he did reach out and love those who were at times unlovable. But he never stooped down to their level of behavior. He never engaged in the toxicity of what they were doing. In fact, the converse of that was true. He was always calling them out of those things. He was saying things like, I don't condemn you, but don't go and sin anymore. And so he was always the influencer. He was always the one pointing the way. He didn't pull punches. He was calling people to be disciples. Uh, but at the same time, he never allowed himself to get in the, the muck of what their lives were about. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33, the apostle Paul said this, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It's just a reality that, that when we spend too much time in bad company, it has an effect on the character of who we are. And, and so in other words, Paul said this, write this down. He knew the danger and the propensity for us to lie to ourselves and discount the influence of our company. He said, don't be misled. And the, and the, greatest, the, the greatest misleading force in your life is you. When you start telling yourself, life, well, I, I know I probably shouldn't hang out with them, and when I, when I hang out with her or when I'm with him, yeah, I, I tend to kind of push the limits of what it means to be a child of God, but, but it'll, it'll be okay, and, and hopefully at some point I'll influence them. And, and Paul says, don't be misled. You, you get in that company and you're around it very much. It's going to have an impact on your character. It, it's kind of like in the physical sense. Uh, we, we just flew to Kansas City for conference last week, and, and my wife and I, when we get on a plane, she, she always brings the, the, um, the handy wipes. We have, always have handy wipes, and, and we sit down in our seat, and it's, and we're wiping down armrests and the, 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 the tray table and, and, the, and the seat belt and, and, and the, the air thing up top and, and people are looking at us like you're kind of strange it's like, but the, the problem is there's been a lot of toxic people that have sit in that seat <laughs> not just I mean just in the last 24 hours but even in the last month and, and they don't come through and clean those things I mean they come pick out trash but they don't disinfect all of that stuff and, and, and why, why do we do that is because we understand that there are certain toxic elements and, and diseases that people carry and, and, and germs that they carry that, that can rub off on us and have an impact on us and so just as in the physical sense we have to kind of be vigilant and we tell our kids cough into your elbow and cough away or sneeze you know don't you know wash your hands and all. why do we do that because we understand there are microscopic germs out there that will affect us and make us sick if we're not on guard against them amen the same thing is true in the spirit, and yet there are, there are spiritual germs, as it were, and there are spiritual influences out there that we can't see with the naked eye, but they are just as toxic and just as dangerous, and if we're not on guard for them, they can pollute our soul. Amen? And so we have to be on guard, and, and we see it in children on the playground. We see it kids in school, teenagers with their peers, with peer pressure, adults with their, their hangout buddies, but, but I've seen people lose out with God. I've seen people get bitter with the church. I've seen people that, that wind up leaving the church simply because they had a toxic relationship, 
and influence in their life that over time the germs and the poison, poisonous toxins of their, their speech and their attitude just drip, drip, dripped into that person till ultimately the only reason that person ultimately lost out with God is because of the influences around them. And they never were able to step back and say, you know what, this is a toxic relationship. This is not a good relationship for me, and I'm not helping them, so I, I need to get away from this. I've seen godly teenagers start hanging out with friends from school and, and engaging in activities that they once wouldn't and, and making excuses and parents making excuses. and Well, they, they need to be close to them, and they need to hang out with them. And How are they going to win them? But they'll allow them to begin hanging out in environments that Christians really shouldn't be involved in and around temptations that, that we're just kind of laying out there in front of our children. It, and, and exposing them to, and, and, and I've seen this in adults. I've seen, you know, men of God who at one point wouldn't laugh at certain jokes, but they, they get around it so much, and now they're kind of in the mix of what's going on at work, and, and they don't feel guilty for it anymore. And over time, that toxic influence of the world becomes a part. I've seen people uh, get involved in sexual messes because boundaries that once were clear get murky and, and the lines of, of what's inappropriate just kind of get fuzzy and excuses are made and we're just friends and you know, we're, we're not, nothing's going to happen and, and over time the, the germs and the toxicity of lust get in their spirit and, and there's a fall. And so we have to be on guard with our principles, with our dedication. And so I want to point out to you tonight for the next few minutes three types of toxic people that will come your way. They probably have all already come your way. If not, they're coming your way at some point. The first type of toxic person is the chronic critic. And you know them very well. If they are going to speak, it's going to be criticism. It's going to be something negative. They write this down. They find fault in everything and everyone. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too rainy. It's too dry. The weather's always bad. doesn't matter what it is. They complain when they don't have what they want. They get what they want, and then they complain about what they have. They complain about the things they believe they deserve to have. They complain about the things that they once have that they don't have anymore. They're just going to find anything to complain about. They complain about the service at the restaurant, the food, the tables, the lighting, the portion size, too salty, not salty enough. He's not attentive enough. She needs to come back. Always complain. They complain about other friends to you, and then when they're not with you, they complain about you to other friends. Uh, they're just complainers. They're always going to find fault. Uh, and so they are, they are chronic in their complaints. And they may even go to church with you and complain about the church, about the building. It's too bright. It's not bright enough. It's too cold. It's too warm. The music is too loud. I can't hear what they're saying. That's, they, they sing too many slow songs. Why don't we sing more fast songs? Why, man, the, the pastor, man, he was really loud on Sunday, and he was really calm on Wednesday. And, 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 and the, the piano player needs to play this way, and, and the drummer was too loud. I can't hear the drummer. I mean, it's always something to complain about. And one thing about chronic critics is that they wear you out. Write this down. Their criticism is rarely constructive. It's always pointing out the problem. Their judgmental spirit clogs your heart and their gossip affects your opinion of others. Beware of the chronic critic. And let me just say this. If you tend to be critical, beware of yourself. You can grow beyond that. God, by the grace of God and the power of His Spirit, you can overcome a chronic critical spirit. You say, how do I do that? You do it by speaking good. You do it by starting to do good. You start looking for the things that are positive, commenting on the positive, praising the thing, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are just. What, do you get the point? If there be any virtue, if there be any, think on these things because you start thinking more about those things, guess what? That's what you're going to talk about. 
You're going to speak. So speak faith. Speak positive. Speak. That doesn't mean that you never have concerns. It doesn't mean that you never address concerns. It just means that you're not going to go around just yeah, 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 about everything and everyone in your life. If you have a problem with someone, go talk to them. If you have a problem with the church, go talk to the person that you have the problem with. Don't just be a negative Nelly. No offense to any Nellies that are here tonight. A few, a few months ago, I talked about Debbie Downer and, <laughs> and Sister Dickerson, no offense. <laughs> so if I use your name in one of these things, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> but seriously, though, be true to yourself. Be honest with yourself. And, and we all have our issues. We all have the things we struggle with. And when you find yourself hearing yourself always complaining, always down on everything, make it up, make a point in your mind, I'm going to start looking for good things and that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm, I'm going to speak on those things. I'm going to commend people. I'm going to look for things to compliment in people, not just the negative things to gripe about. Amen? So beware the chronic critic, whether it's somebody else or whether it's you. Number two is the chronic controller. These are toxic people. These people, write it down, are overbearing and force their way and their opinions upon you regardless of your will. They are controlling people. And generally with controlling people, it starts very subtly over time. And slowly but surely, you begin to feel like you are losing your personal identity. This can be in a marriage. This can be in a friendship where, you know, when it starts out, we're buddies, we're doing everything together. But over time, it's like everything about your life, your time becomes controlled. And, and, if, and, if, and if they're not in control and it's not their way, then, then they're going to get upset. And, and you're barely able to make the, the simplest decisions for yourself. And you're always surrendering because you want, you want to avoid a fight and a disagreement. And here's the deal. Write this down. They know how to manipulate. They wield fear and guilt as weapons that ultimately crush your soul. And again, you may be that person. And you have to be honest with yourself and say, you know what? Do I use my moods to guilt the people in my life? Do I use my, my, my attitude in order to drive fear into people so I can get what I want? Or do I use guilt as a weapon and make, try to make people feel guilty to get what I want? Because ultimately, if you are doing that, you are toxic to them. There's a right way and a wrong way to try to get what you need out of a relationship. Guilt and fear are not two of them. So don't manipulate with your moods. And if you're around someone who constantly is manipulating with their moods, um, you need to move on. Asterisk point. If you're married to them, you just got to deal with it. You don't get to just move on. Okay, you got to work through things. Get some counseling. Talk with each other. But I'm talking about friendships, relationships, and things like that where you, you, know, you, you have a choice in. There are some people that you just kind of have to move on. You love them. You pray for them. You're kind to them. But you're not going to spend a whole lot of time with them. Amen? And then there are the tantalizing tempters. This person encouraged you to do things that you know you shouldn't and may not normally even want to do. Perhaps it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend who pressures, pressures you to do things that you wanted to wait until marriage for. Maybe it's a friend who is involved in certain vices, drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be, that tries to get you to, hey, try it out. It's, it'll be okay. It's fun. It's going to be a good time. Maybe it's a family member who, who pressures you to, to live a lifestyle that's beyond your financial means. And because everybody else does it, you can charge it up. You can finance it, and it'll be okay. And, and they, and they kind of tantalize you into bad financial decisions in your life. Or, or maybe it's an old Facebook friend that you connect with that you used to go to high school with, and, and, and you kind of had a little crush on at one point, and, and and you kind of just start communicating. And after all, we're just catching up. We're, we're just friends. And then they say, hey, let's go to lunch. And let's, let's just catch up on old times. And they're just that tantalizer that, I'll oh, just come on. And things you normally wouldn't do, they try to get you involved in. Or maybe it's, it can even be a fellow church member who starts to kind of talk down your personal convictions and things that you hold dear in your life and, and consecrations that you made in your life to God. And they start saying, oh, that's so old-fashioned and that's so out of date and you shouldn't, you, you don't have to do that anymore. And, and, and why don't you just engage? And most of the time they're, they're trying to talk you into it because they don't want to feel guilty for not doing it. 
If they can get you involved, that, then it'll, it'll be okay. But hear me, stay true to your convictions. Stay true to the principles in your life. Stay, ultimately, stay true to godly principles. But God is going to put principles in your life, convictions in your life, for you personally. That, that you, know, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And there are certain things that Jesus said would be weights and, and things that, that we need to kind of cut off and, and pluck out that, that, are, that are damaging to us that we, you know, somebody else may be able to do, but not me. Amen? A lot of times the tempter is not this horrible, horned devil person, but they're, they're just people that thrive on trying to get you to do it their way or involved in their fun, quote, unquote. And so it's okay, Pastor. They're, those are the people, but, but how, do we, how do we deal with the toxins, the toxic people? The, the first thing that, that you have to ask yourself is what kind of Christian do I want to be? Do I, do I want to be a, a Christian of convenience or a Christian of, conven, of conviction? And, and here's the thing. There's all kinds of varieties in our world. And there, there are different types of churches in our world where it can be a religion of convenience. And I'm not here to point fingers at anybody. I'm just saying it's the reality. There are, there are many places you can go where it's just it's a convenient Christianity. It's just to show up, do your religious thing, sing your song, feel good, put a a few dollars in the offering plate, and then go on and, and live life however you want to live. But you have to ask yourself, am I going to be a Christian of convenience or of conviction? Am I, and I'm, am I going to be passive in my Christianity, or am I going to be serious about purity and holiness in my life? And it, here's the deal. If, if your answer is, is, I just kind of want a convenient Christianity, then really this lesson isn't for you. I'm glad you're here, but it's not going to do you a whole lot of good because uh, to purify yourself requires some sacrifice. It requires some, some determination. And, and I, you know, I, I preached to you on Sunday that there are things that, that we as a church and as an individuals have not seen and we have not yet heard because they're reserved for those who love him. And love him means obey him. To love him means to present our bodies a living sacrifice. To love him is to follow peace and holiness with all men, without which no man shall see the Lord. And so, so it equals sacrifice in our lives. And so if you're a person of conviction, here's what your desire will be. I want to be the influencer in the relationships in my life. I want to be the one who's setting the tone of my relationships, not vice versa. I want to be the one that I'm with somebody I'm calling the shots, as it were, not in a controlling sense, but I set the tone in how we talk, the things that we do, the things that we don't do, because I am a child of God first and foremost. Before I'm your friend, before I'm your wife or your husband or your coworker, I'm a child of God. And so I'm going to set the tone in this relationship because I want to make sure that first and foremost, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen? And I want to win others to him. And so how do you deal with the toxic nature of some people? Number one in your notes is you set and or respect healthy boundaries. But understand why boundaries are important. When you're driving down the highway, when you're navigating a dangerous turn or there's a cliff on a turn, what, what are there? There are guardrails. There are boundaries that are there to keep you from going off of the edge. That's not mean. It's not cruel. It's not, you know, the people in charge of, of roads. That's not their way of saying, I'm going to make sure you stay on the asphalt. And you say, how dare you? How dare you keep me on the road? Right? I mean, no, I see that as, as a good thing. If, if you have animals dogs, most likely you have a fence in your yard. Why? Because dogs have a natural tendency to want to leave the confines of your yard, and they don't realize what's the danger of a car or other bigger dogs or the fact that they might get lost outside of the yard, and so we put fences up. We also put fences up to keep other things out, right? We don't want things getting into our yard that don't belong there. And so one of the ways that, that we are able to keep toxic relationships and influences out of our lives and us away from certain relationships is by setting up boundaries in our life. I mean, as a pastor, my, one of my responsibilities is because 
I am accountable for watching for your soul that I have to at times say, hey, as a church, we're, we're, we're not going to go this direction or we're going we're to keep this out of our lives and, and we're, we're going to avoid these kind of activities and we're, we're going to embrace other activities. You say, well, that sounds very controlling. No, it sounds like it's a responsibility. Just like you, as a responsibility head of your home, have a responsibility to watch out for your children because they are placed under your care, the pastor is responsible for the saints under his care. And so you as parents, there are times where your children say, I want to go, I want to do, can I, may I, and you just say, no. Why? There are time, most of the time you can say, well, this is why. There are some times you just say, because I said so. And I'm responsible for you. And I'm looking out for you. And either you love me, you trust me as your parent, or you're going to go out and rebel and reap the consequence of that. And so boundaries are important in our lives. Write this down. Fences keep the bad out and the good in. When you look at Jesus, he set boundaries routinely. Jesus loved everyone equally, but he didn't treat everyone equally. He had 12 disciples, not 1,200. Now, he loved the whole world, but he didn't treat everybody equally. He, he select, write this down. He, he didn't select everyone in the world to be in his inner circle. In fact, he actually fenced some people out. They were called the Pharisees. The harder they tried to tempt him, control him, the more forceful he became in resisting and declaring truth, and the less he would tolerate them. You watch in his ministry, he, he, he starts just calling them out and saying, no, you're, you have no influence here. You need, you need to back off. I mean, he, even those that were close to Jesus hit, hit the wall every once in a while. When, when he began to talk about that he, he needed to go and he needed to be sacrificed and needed to, to die, die on the cross, Matthew 16, 23, Peter is trying to get him, talk him out of it, and Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block unto me. You do not have in mind that the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And so he just kind of said, Yes, you're acting a little bit like the devil right now. So just Now, I don't recommend doing that with your friends or your family <laughs> and saying it quite that way, but it is okay to be emphatic. I say, no, 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 I'm not, not going there, not going that direction, not going to listen to you in, in that regard. See, Jesus, write this down, was willing to stand up and emphatically hold his ground. And far too many Christians aren't. We live in a world of tolerance, and we have mistaken tolerance as acceptance. I can tolerate some things but I, that I don't have to accept. And we live in a culture that, expect, that, that thinks that to tolerate it means you have to accept it, you have to embrace it. No, I don't. And we need to learn as young people to hold your ground. You can be loving, you can be kind, you can tolerate anybody. You can be kind to anybody, but that doesn't mean you have to accept every behavior as normal or right or, or something to be involved in. And, and they may call you, oh, you're hateful, you're mean. No, I'm not. Don't be hateful to anybody. Don't be ugly to anybody, but stand for what's right. You don't have to back down from standing what, for what is right. And so t two keys to, in establishing healthy boundaries. Number one is speak clearly and directly to the toxic person. If it's someone who's talking you down, who's, who's, who's belittling you, trying to tear you down, look at them and say, I will not let you talk to me that way. I will not let you treat me that way. Be direct. You're not a walking mat. You're, you're not, you don't have to stand and take abuse. You can speak up and say, no, we're not going there. Or when somebody tries to infect you with their gossip, gossip you can say, you know what, I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm just not going to let you talk to me about this. This is not right. I'm, we're not going to go there. Um, if your friends try to talk to you, try to get you, you know, to looking at the opposite sex in a lustful way, just say, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk that way. But I just, 
I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about them in that way. Now you say, Pastor, that, that's awkward, you know, to speak up, and they might think that I'm weird. And it may be awkward at first, but if you stand your ground and you do it in such a way where you're not trying to be holier than thou, you're not trying to say, you're horrible and I'm good, but you're just saying, you know, I have boundaries in my life. I don't talk that way. I don't do that. I don't go there. I'm not involved in that. So don't, don't talk to me that way. You do that enough times and in the right spirit. You know what's going to happen? One thing is going to happen is that eventually people People are going to be getting to respect you. They may not agree with you. They, they, they may still kind of push you at times, but there will be a, a respect in most cases that people will develop for you because they will, they will find out that you truly are a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're not just a religious person. Because religious people will let down and they'll do things. In one instance, they won't do another. But true disciples of Jesus have true boundaries in their life. And they just aren't going to do certain things. Number two, explain to people, I'm not going there with you. If your friends, your family want to decide to live in a toxic way, you don't have to join them. I don't care if it's a wild party, a get-together, inappropriate location, a request to engage in sexual activity, invitation to an appropriate conversation. You just simply need to say, I'm not going down that road, period. It's not going there. Oh, come on, you, it'll be all right. You, you know, you, you don't have to do it all, but no, I just, I'm not going there. Write this down. No is one of the most powerful sentences you will ever utter. He said, Pastor, that's not a sentence. It can be. When evil men entice thee, what? Consent thou not. In other words, just say No. You don't have to give a reason. Oh, come on, come to that party. Oh, come on, be involved in this. Oh, come on, drink this. Oh, come on, let's just, just go out with her. I know she's not a believer. I know she's not a Christian, but she's, she's nice. I just, just, just no. Oh, come on, we love each other. Let's, we, we, we're going to get married anyway. No. Hey, let me just tell you. Let me just tell you about this. Let me share this. No. That, that's a powerful sentence that you can give in any situation. You don't always give an, a reason for, to your children for saying no, right? No. Can I, can I? No. Why not? I just, no. Can I, can I get this? Can I have this? No. And they can pout and they can complain, but just, just no. There's some, it's just no. And if we could learn to say that to temptation, just say no. And the tempter comes back and says, oh, why not? It's okay. It's going to be all right. You, you know, you're a good person. You deserve this. And he'll tell you all kinds of lies. But ultimately, you just have to say no. Oh, come on, just think that way. Just talk that way. No, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. The reason why we say no to our kids at times is because we want to protect them. We want them to be nourished and to grow up to be healthy, responsible, to be grateful, and not to be spoiled. And so we do all of these things because we feel it's in their best interest. And as a child of God with our soul, there are times where we just have to say no because we know, in all honesty, it's just not good for our soul. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Let us... Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that does so easily entangle us. So there are some things that are just hindrances in our life. They're not even necessarily sins. They're just hindrances. They're weights. The second way you deal with toxic relationships, if boundaries haven't worked, write this down, you have to sever chronically toxic relationships. When I was growing up, we had a dog. Her name was Sugar. Sugar was one of the ugliest dogs you'll ever see in your life, but about as sweet a dog as you could be around. She was what you would call a mutt. Um, Sugar, one night, got out of the yard, went running down the street and across a busier street, and got hit by a car and survived. But one of her front legs was paralyzed in the process. Well, we, my father took good care of us as a family, but things were tight in those years. And we didn't have the money to take her to the vet and get it amputated and do all of that. So Sugar just kind of had to drag that leg. And that leg got 
calloused and was limiting and she couldn't move as good as she ought to have moved and it really limited her ability uh, to, to do and be as healthy as she could have been. And if we could have amputated it, she probably would have had a little bit better quality life in the long run. Wouldn't have been dragging that kind of calloused, uh, maimed leg around. And you say, that's really a sad story, Pastor. But it's to prove a point. There are some things in our life that are better amputated than just dealing with. There are some things we just need to cut off. Jesus said very emphatically, if your right hand offends you, you cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. And I know that, that sounds, he's not saying literally, but he's trying to po- prove a point here that, hey, you need to be honest. If there are things in your life that need to be cut off or plucked out or put aside, you better do it because you're better off getting into heaven with the pain of what it takes to get rid of certain things in your life than to lose out and have those things in your life that are difficult to cut off. And so when it, write this down, when it comes to friends and relationships that threaten our spiritual health, there are times you have to cut them off. Now, you say, Pastor, well, so you're saying we shouldn't befriend people who are unsaved, we shouldn't be trying to shine God's love in their heart. And I'm not saying that. I'm just saying until it begins to affect you more than you affecting it. And your soul begins to be tainted. And you, and you say, well, should I just cut it off? Or, well, you may not need to cut it off. There are some things you just need to step up in. <laughs> yeah, you, you may be the one at fault. You just need to stand up. You need to act. You have to respond in those situations. And, and that person at work who maybe keeps flirting with you that you kind of just play along with, you may just have to stand up and say, you know what? No more of this. I, I, we're not, you can't talk to me that way anymore. And there are, there are a lot of things, if you'll stand up for, they will stop. But if you, keep, if you stand up and you take, you, know, you take precaution and you do what you have to do and it keeps on and on, and at some point, that's a relationship you just have to move on from. You love them, you pray for them, you're kind to them, but you have to move on from because they have the effect of corrupting your good character. Genesis thirty nine twelve. Joseph with Potiphar's wife, you likely know the story where, you know, he's in this house where he's been entrusted as a steward of of his master's goods, and and the master's out, and and the wife makes an advance at him and tries to get him to uh, be sexually intimate with her, and she caught, caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me, but he left his cloak in her hand, and he ran out of the house. You know what he was saying? No. But he said it with his actions. I'm out of here. I'm cutting off of this relay. I'm getting out of it. And here's the deal. It cost him to do the right thing. He wound up in prison for doing the right thing. So hear me, young people, moms and dads, everybody in between and above, you may do the right thing and it may cost you, but again, you're better off being right with God, getting to heaven, than to have easy street here and have no conflict and to lose out with God. Amen? So write this down. Cutting off toxic relationships can sometimes cost you in the short term, but will preserve your soul in the long term. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be not, yo- be not yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteous and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Okay, you can't be righteous while fellowshipping wickedness. You can't remain light while you're accepting and participating in darkness. Again, Jesus ate with sinners, but he never did what sinners did. He didn't engage in their sinfulness or or allow them to influence his holiness. He didn't condemn them, but he spoke up and said, don't sin anymore. He taught them. He spoke up to them. So I'm not saying don't be friends with sinners. I'm not saying don't be an influencer in your world. What I am saying is be an influencer, not an influencee. So understand, cutting someone off is a last resort. And generally, the younger you are, the more common cutting off a relationship is because when you're younger, young people, 
You're still searching for your identity. You're still trying to figure things out. And, and you have to be a lot more careful because you're a lot more influenced and pressured. And so you may have to be more apt and more aggressive in cutting off relationships in your life than you do later as you go on and the more mature you become. But, but we never outgrow that potential for us needing to choose our friends carefully. Proverbs 12, 26, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. And here's the, the, the awesome thing. As we mature in the Lord, there are fewer and fewer people we have to sever relationships with. We just have to learn, write this down, to set up safe boundaries and grow stronger in our ability to say no. And so the closer you get to God and the more mature you come in your relationship with him, there's fewer and fewer relationships you, you, you need to cut off because you're strong. You're able to say no. But again, once you're, you stop being able to say no and you, you feel yourself in a state of weakness, you have to be honest and say, you know, I've got to back off from this relationship. In your notes, the only reason to distance yourself from someone is to protect yourself so you can be spiritually strong, know God more intimately, and share his love freely. Now, here's the temptation. I'm almost done. Here's the temptation. We tend to want to cut off the relationships that God wants us to keep. Why? We want to cut off the relationships to try our patience that try our mercy, that, that, that try us when it comes to our ability to forgive and try us in, in the areas where ultimately God is calling us to grow and demonstrate the fruit of his spirit. And so here's, here's what you will face. You'll be more tempted and more apt to say, I'm cutting that relationship off because it's something that God's trying to improve in you, your patience or your mercy. Everybody following me? the people that reveal just how Christ-like you are, and then the people who are toxic that you should be kind of pushing aside are the ones you're more apt to keep because they tend to cater to your carnal nature. And it's easier to give in to those people. And so be careful that you don't see yourself embracing relationships that actually are toxic and more difficult to really back away from and saying, well, okay, I'm going to cut them off because they just try my patience. God says, no, <laughs> there's a purpose in that relationship. You need to learn something in that relationship. And the goal, hear me, is to have your spirit pure enough, your soul pure enough that you recognize the difference. Amen? And so I, I challenge you tonight, step back, look at your relationships, and ask yourself, God, is there a relationship, dating relationship, friendship, whatever it may be, a work relationship that I need to either back off from or cut off? And if so, and it's for the right reasons, God, give me the courage and the strength to do it. And then, are there any relationships that I backed off from that ultimately I need to re-engage in? Because it's just, I, the reason I've disengaged is because it's just uncomfortable. I don't want to have to deal with things. I don't want to have to do what God would have me to do. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. So my, my challenge to you is be the influencer. Be the one that stands up. Be the one that, that says and sets the tone. The one that's able to stand up and say, no, not going there, not talking about that, not doing that. And man, that's what salt and light is in the world. When we're that influencing presence in our world. Amen? Amen. Remember, be inviting people. Grab some cards on your way out. Um, let's try to get... A bunch of guests here. We're starting revival on Sunday. Brother Gillum is going to be here. He's powerful. He's energetic. He's going to motivate us. He's going to be reaching out for those who need Jesus. And so um, take some cards with you. I've, I've got a couple of people I connected with this week, and, and I've had others we've had coming in. So get your picture with them. Email it to the church. Let's, let's build this up. And we, need, we want to invite 1,000 people this month. It is doable. All that really requires is each person inviting about three people. If our regular Sunday attendance would invite two and a half to three people, um, that's 1,000 people in a month. And, and I, I'm believing we're, we're going to get 100 guests here this month. So do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name.